for this drawing, you want to have a pretty sharp pencil. Now, I usually recommend that you use a pencil that's not super sharp. A lot of times for shading, it's really not helpful to have a super sharp pencil. But for this one, we're going to be doing a lot of very finely detailed drawing. So it is kind of important that you keep your pencil sharp. And then for your colors, you're going to need a brown for dead leaves. And then two colors for these boxes here. We're going to color code some things. I'm going to use red and green. You don't have to use those. You can use something else, but you'll need two colors for those. So we're going to start by talking about what type of plant this is. This is a bromeliad. And a bromeliad is a type of epiphyte. Now an epiphyte means epi, this means um, around or on the surface, and phyte means leaf or plant. So this is a plant that grows on other plants. Let's look at some pictures. Zoom in here on some epiphytes. Here's some bromeliad epiphytes that are growing on a tree. You can hardly see the tree here. It's all covered with vines and moss and everything. But this plant is growing up perhaps in the canopy of the rainforest. Here's one that's growing on a fairly thin branch. Right here it looks like nothing more than a stick. And there you have a big plant growing right there on top of it. Here's an, another epiphyte growing on a tree. See the tree right here? And this is has some thinner leaves than the other ones that we were looking at. This is more typical of the epiphytes you buy as houseplants. And there's another one way up probably in the canopy of uh, the rainforest. Now epiphytes have roots, but they don't take in nutrients through the roots. The roots are just for hanging on to things. So here we have some epiphytes that are hanging on to a telephone wire. Those are actually living plants growing on a telephone wire. So obviously there's no dirt up here, so the roots are not absorbing nutrients or water. So they do that through their leaves, but the roots can hang on to just about anything. Now there's many types of epiphyte plants. We're just going to look at the bromeliad type of epiphyte. And you're probably already familiar with bromeliad, so you don't know it because a pineapple is a bromeliad. So what do all bromeliads have in common? Well, one thing that makes a bromeliad a bromeliad is that the leaves are in what we call a rosette, around a center like this. The leaves all come out of a center. And oftentimes, they're very thick and very close together. And as we'll see in this drawing, it's very important that water can collect. Now, you could even try this with a pineapple. You know, if you... Um, poured water over the top of a pineapple. You know, you might even be able to collect water like in here. Not as much as in some of these bromeliads we're going to see, but maybe a little bit. So the flower is in the center here, and the leaves are kind of red. Oftentimes bromeliads are very brightly colored, like that, like this, yellows and pinks. Flowers are really stunning, They're beautiful colors. Okay, so let's look at a few more pictures. There's a bromeliad that has collected rainwater. You can see the shiny down here. This is a puddle, there's a puddle, puddle. And these puddles can last for weeks, which is very good because when you think about it, there really aren't a lot of puddles in the rainforest. There's a lot of water, it rains almost every day, but the ground is very absorbent. It's like raining on a sponge and the water just goes right into the ground. And so a lot of rain, but really no puddles. So if you're an animal that needs a puddle for your life cycle, like say a frog or a lot of um, 
flies and beetles that need to lay their eggs and their larvae in puddles, these bromeliad plants are a critical part of their life cycle. Let's see, here's a, here's a little tadpole. Can you see? Here's the tadpole right here. There's the body. There's the two little eyes, the tail. Tadpole there in the puddle. And here's some little dart frogs. There's one. And there's one. And toward the you can't see the puddles, but they would be in there somewhere. So if we slice through one of these bromeliad plants, we might see something like this, which is kind of what our drawing is going to look like. We'd see some puddles collecting here. Here's the like the the bud that's going to make a flower. We do see roots, but the roots, okay, here they're in some soil, I think. Oftentimes they grow in and around a tree, so if the tree's rotting, that might be kind of like dirt. Rotten wood might provide some nutrition. But the primary purpose of these roots isn't to absorb water and nutrients, like in most plants. The primary purpose is just to hang on. And we'll see what structures up here in the leaves they're going to use to absorb their water and their nutrients. So let's start by drawing the roots down here. Let's go down the bottom. I'll zoom in a bit. And let's draw a surface here, whether it's going to be maybe a tree or dirt. We're not going to be real specific here, but let's draw along like that. And then over here like this. You could even continue over there. And then some roots coming off like this, looking stringy, you saw in that picture. And of course, roots are always a little bit larger near the plant, and then they get smaller. Of course, yours do not have to look like mine. You don't have to watch me draw and try to imitate these. You can just draw your own little roots. As we said, they're mainly for keeping the plant anchored, stuck to whatever it's hanging on. Now, it actually might have a more substantial root system. Yours can go all the way down if you want to, but we're not going to spend too much time here fussing with the roots. That's good enough. Then, before we leave the roots, what I want to do is come over here and make sort of a branching thing that goes off. One way that these guys can reproduce is to make little kind of shoots off the side. Sometimes they look kind of scaly like that. Come up like this. They may actually be running along the surface. You might not even... It looks here it's like it's buried, but doesn't even need to be. Okay, and then right here it'll produce a baby plant basically. And I put a note here, bromeliads produce pups near the base of the plant. So just like it's a baby dog or something, call it a pup. Well, a lot of a lot of things are called pups, not just dogs. You find that word very commonly. Okay. So we just draw a nice little kind of shaggy looking baby plant there. And then you can just go like that. I've got the words written right there already for you. Just put an arrow over and you know what you've drawn. So that's what we call vegetative reproduction where you just kind of make a runner over and sprout a new plant. Lots of plants do that, like strawberries. Lots of, all kinds of ivy does that. And of course we have the note down here 
tank bromeliads, and tank means that they have those puddles. So not all of them will form puddles if they're really skinny. Maybe there could be some, there could be some more like that that are kind of too thin, but we're talking about these with the big thick leaves. Tank bromeliads can grow on the ground, but mostly they grow on trees, often high up in the canopy. And you can put um, an extra note here, roots. Don't take in much water or nutrients. I mean, they might a little, but essentially they don't. They've got a plan B for water and nutrients. We'll see, next let's go up here and draw the flower bud. Let me zoom out just a teeny bit here, not too much. And let me show you a cross-section drawing so you kind of know where we're going with this. So, like in this picture, they've sliced it as if you took a knife and you sliced down and then where the knife touched that's these stripy areas here that's your cut edge so we're going to draw something that kind of looks like this with these things coming up but from the top if you were looking straight down like this you'd see this all right so it's going to kind of look like these long stringy things but remember from the top it actually kind of looks like this so we need to start by making, now draw lightly because you might want to erase, these are our starter lines, kind of coming up like this, this kind of bud shape thing like that. And then you see here where there's, there's a water line and I have some gaps. Those gaps are where you're going to make some things go up like that. So just keep going with your pencil, do that, and then go down a little bit and make another one. Make it down a little bit, make another one. Yours don't have to look just like mine. You don't have to make the exact same number as I do. So you get this general idea right. do the same on the other side. So this is a flower that kind of comes up out of the water. It's used to growing in a puddle. So it's really best if you don't pick up your pencil, just keep going. Just nice and slow. And then if you run out of space here, like, oh, I think I'm running out of space, you can just kind of make a, a low one like that. That's fine. Okay, and then you could even just erase right where they connect because you want to look like one shape. Oh, one shape. Like that. It's kind of what you'd see, like if you've ever cut a cabbage in half or a lettuce, you kind of sort of see one of these. This kind of shape. It's got a core, like leaves going out. And then up here, we can just make some things like that so that we know that there's others there in the water, like that. So this is kind of like a flower bud.
then if you'd like to on this leaf we're actually not I don't think we're gonna really put anything on this leaf up here if you would like to shade a little bit use the side of your pencil don't ruin that nice sharp point there go like this a little bit might actually just leave a little thin edge there so it looks like a cut and you can just take your finger like that kind of blend it and then it kind of looks like it's sort of curved around a little bit like that might even look good if you go Take this one maybe up to the top. Remember, keep your pencil on the edge, you know. Ruin that sharp point. Now we're going to go down to this circle down here and we're going to talk about the microscopic view. So this view, what we're going to see in the circle is basically going to be right here. Make a tiny circle, We've got a little bit of an edge. Can you see the edge of the leaf there? Make a little circle and then make an arrow, it looks like it's getting bigger and that will kind of be our expanding arrow so we know it's a little circle blown up really really big in fact it would be a lot bigger than this the scale is not quite right but you get the idea we're going to take a microscopic look at what's going on here so let's make the edge down here about just make a nice light line like this that's going to be the edge of our leaf. And of course, leaves are made of cells, plant cells. So let's make it look sort of like it's some bricks. Oftentimes, plant cells really are kind of rectangular. They're kind of blocky looking. So we're going to make some blocky looking plant cells. And then we can really make it look like a brick wall here. I'm going to make some underneath. And we're not going to get into all the anatomy of the plant here. We're just going to kind of go like that. And then we can label these plant cells. They're not bricks, they're cells. Of course, they'd have a nucleus in them and all kinds of cell parts. But we're not going to worry about that right now. What we need to do is draw some special features that come off of these cells. First, let's look at some photos. So here's some little hair-like structures. This is what we're going to draw, except we're going to really zoom in. These are called trichomes. And I've written the word trichome right here for you. Trichomes absorb water and nutrients. So these little hairs are going to be on the inside of the leaf. They maybe don't look just like this, but I thought that was a pretty good picture of uh, these little plant hairs. So what does this look like on a microscopic view? Well, recognize right here, this is kind of what we just drew. Here's all these cells like this down here. And this has got some air spaces in here. It's a little more complicated, but like over here, this is basically what we drew. And so We've got this cell stuck to another really long skinny cell. So trichomes can be just simply very long skinny cells kind of sticking off like this. That one has some kind of special feature in there. They stained it because this red dot is important. They were looking at, this is called, a, I think, a glandular. This is going to make something. Actually, um, plants that have like smelly substances that we like to used for spices like um, thyme and oregano and basil and all those. They actually have little tiny hairs where that 
that that flavor that we like the flavor is made right here that's where it comes from okay let's look at a few more let's look at some shapes down here trichomes can look like just simple like this pretty simple could be like one cell can be a stack of cells can be uh, there's some cells going off of cells like the branching a lot of different options and here's again some microscope pictures some branching ones okay so you get the idea what we're going to do here is we're going to take maybe I don't know two of our cells here and now sometimes they're the, this actual cell going off like this or maybe it's a cell on top of the cell it doesn't matter either way you're just going to go like this and make it look like a long skinny hair going off like that okay and then maybe another one down here we can make ours fairly simple if you want to make it branched, you can. I don't know. I'm just going to make mine pretty simple here. Okay, so we have it labeled right here. It says trichomes absorb water and nutrients. So let's just point to it. This is the trichome. So let's talk about the nutrients. If it's absorbing nutrients, what are the nutrients and where do they come from? First, let's put some dots in and around here to be the nutrients. They'd actually be tinier than the dot. They'd actually probably be invisible even on this scale. So the water is filled with tiny, tiny bits of nutrients. What kind? Well, little bits of dissolved minerals, maybe nitrogen and iron, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, lots of minerals in the water that the plant needs. Now remember, it's a plant, so it's green and it's doing photosynthesis. So it doesn't need to get like sugar for energy. The leaves are, are doing photosynthesis. So down here in the, in the cells, okay, we would have chloroplasts Actually, you could even if you wanted to, you could get out your little green. You could put green chloroplasts. Okay, I could point to them. I can add an extra note here. Chloroplasts. That'd be C H L O R O, and then plasts. Chloroplasts do photo just like take a photo sin s y n and then the t h e and then s i s so to remind ourselves it is a plant it's green because of these chloroplasts and that means that it is making sugars so it doesn't need sugars from the water but it does need lots of minerals can't make minerals. Minerals are important for all kinds of cellular processes in the plant. Okay, so a lot of it's, we can write minerals. So where are these coming from? Let's make, make some bits that get a little bit bigger like this as they go up. Because these are getting broken down. They used to be larger. And they've got broken down into little, little tiny bits. They used to be larger. Let's put them up here. And what are they? Well, they're bits of dead leaf and insect poop. So it's just very poop is has a lot of minerals. Very, very rich in it. So let's put bits of dead leaf and 
you can put uh, put the scientific word feces f e c e s little bits of organic matter and then it gets broken down smaller and smaller until it's so small that the plant can absorb it. It just dissolves right into the water. And we'll see what's doing this chopping. Okay, so also floating around in the water we would have some bacteria. Just make some little rods like this. Like that. We won't oh, make a whole lot. It would there would be many more than this, but we'll just draw a few and we'll write bacteria. The bacteria would be helping to break things down, releasing some of the nutrients. And then we would have some there's some other bacteria too actually that's in strings like this. Interestingly enough, there this would also be this would be um, it's called cyanobacteria. C Y A N O cyanobacteria and they used to be called blue green algae. They're actually kind of greenish blue because they can do photosynthesis. So you have a little bit of green algae floating in there. And then we're going to meet in the rest of the drawing some of the organisms that are chopping these, that are processing these, because these used to be really, really big bits. They got smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally they're so small that the bacteria work on them. So it's a gradual process from a huge dead leaf all the way down to tiny nutrients that these plants can absorb, these trichomes can absorb right through their cell wall. So speaking of dead leaves, let's put some of the big chunks, they'd be bigger than this, remember this is our microscopic view, let's put some of these big chunks of dead leaf in the bottom of these puddles. You see here's a puddle, so go down here and let's just make some some bits of dead leaf. and. This one, actually down here, we should just kind of make this go all the way. Close these off like this, like that. Just continue that down there. Okay, so this is clogged with debris, possibly, dead leaf, dead leaf. Don't go up too high because we're going to draw some other things up there. So, all kinds of So it's easy to imagine how the dead leaves get in there, obviously. It could be leaves from this plant, or it could be leaves from an another plant that just fall off and happen to fall in. This line here. Let's fix this up kind of like that. There. Okay, and then over here, if you look over here, we have the words that go with this dead leaves collect in the puddles. This detritus forms the base of the ecosystem. So let's point to the dead leaves like that. So what does it mean by this detritus forms the base of the ecosystem? Well, let's look at another ecosystem. Here's a standard um, pyramid explanation of how ecosystems work. And at the bottom, or base, we usually have producers, which is like plants that make their own food. It could be bacteria, but it's usually green plants that use the sunlight to make food. So they don't eat anything. Autotrophs means they make their own food. So these are the things that use the sun. And then we have animals that eat the plants and we call them primary consumers and sometimes we call them herbivores because they eat plants and here we have a grasshopper and a zebra 
So the primary consumers are the first things that come along and they eat the plants, they eat the producers. Then we have secondary consumers, and these are the animals that eat the primary consumers. So here we've got um, a lion and some kind of carnivorous bird here. So the secondary consumers eat the primary consumers, which eat the producers. And then at the top here, when these animals die, we get the top, the decomposers. So when the lion dies, the little creatures, the bacteria and the worms and bugs, eat the body and return it to the soil, and then it goes back around again. The lion's body helps become dirt, and then the plants grow in the dirt. They use the sunlight like this. So the important words here are primary consumer and secondary consumer, because we're going to label those in our drawing. So, but the ecosystem here is not actually based on on photosynthesis. We have a plant here and it's doing photosynthesis, but the ecosystem we're talking about is in the puddles. We have a whole ecosystem that's just simply in the puddles. So the base of this ecosystem is going to be the nutrients in the puddles. So as we just said, it's, it's what we call detritus. Detritus is like little bits of dead stuff. And so these little bits of dead stuff are going to be the base of our ecosystem. So we could write in here, dead bits of leaves. So what consumes the dead bits of leaves? Those would be our primary consumers. And so I have written up here, primary consumers, we're going to label them at the end, herbivores, plant eaters, and detrivores. So we're going to see a lot of things that eat little bits of dead leaf. All right, so our first dead leaf eater is going to be the crane fly larva. Go right underneath, right underneath these words, this first leaf you come to, don't use that one, use the next one down. And I'm going to zoom in on it. So we're going to make a really quick little sketch of an adult crane fly here. And don't worry, it doesn't have to be perfect, it'll be fine, just oh, we'll make some circles and balls and lines and it'll be fine. So we want to make a little pea-sized circle right about here, like that, and then a slightly larger one head and body, that's what it's going to be, and then kind of a curvy line going up like this. Crane flies kind of have upturned abdomens like that. Put some segments on it like this. And then we're going to give it some wings like this. And then draw a second pair like this. You probably can see some minor parts of the wing like that. And of course, they would have these little fine networks. You know how it looks like mesh? So if you want to do something like that, you can do that later. The important thing now is just to stick a couple of wings on it. And then, um, let's see, maybe i make the head just a tiny bit smaller. So now this is not not a damselfly or a dragonfly, so don't get confused. The head's not too big. It's not going to have those humongous huge eyes and everything. The head's going to be a little bit smaller. That's a little antennae, and so the legs are going to come out. Let's see. Let's make one leg come out like that. They have these really, really long legs, kind of like this, and then like up and out like that. So it's really not related to the dragonfly. All right, now I can kind of, I'm going to kind of darken that in now. I know where the body goes, like that. Okay. So something like that. That's good enough. And let's label it crane fly. These are really spindly, delicate little things. Really, really fragile looking insects. Okay, now what we're most interested in is the larvae. So let's go down, follow the leaf down and the puddle down here. I'm just going to make a little kind of wiggly larvae thing like that. Go like that. It's kind of like a something like that.
and it is a shredder it likes to eat these bits of leaf we can give it a piece of leaf to work on right there it likes to shred the leaves so the larva shreds the leaves I actually got the information I'm going to give you about the types of larvae I got that from a YouTube video I watched uh, by a scientist who went to Costa Rica into a rainforest and they sat there for like weeks on end and watched these little puddles and watched and did experiments and found out all the little larvae that was in here and looked at them under a microscope. So that's where my information is coming from. Okay, so this is uh, one of the organisms that does the big chopping. And then we have littler pieces now that need to get chopped even finer and the marsh beetle larva is really good at that. So this next leaf right under here, let's draw a marsh beetle. And we're going to draw kind of like an oval like this. And then we're going to make a line like that because beetles often have that kind of line there. It's, it's like their wing covers, the wing case. And then make that top part kind of like this. And then we're going to add a head like that. Some little tiny sticking out. And then I'm going to kind of shade mine like this. This is actually a fairly dark beetle, it's like a black beetle. So I can really make it very dark. And then we need to give it some legs sticking out like that. And let's label it marsh beetle. And more importantly, the larva in the water here, we're going to make some little, um, I don't know, they just kind of, it's really hard to tell quite what they look like. I think this is the one I was kind of like a line down the middle, little wormy looking things. Don't really have to look like much, just kind of like that. So these guys are eating the pieces also. They're eating these little bits and they're scraping and shredding it even more. Apparently they what they do is more like scraping their little mouth parts or whatever, they're scrapers. So we could even put larvae. L-A-R-V-A-E, larvae, it's plural, are scrapers. That's what they're doing there. So these are the shredders, these are the scrapers. We're getting smaller bits. And then we have pieces that are so tiny that some other larvae can actually begin to eat. And so these guys also, they're going to be pooping, creating a fecal material. So we can add some, you can add some, yes, you can draw poop, this is appropriate. Draw some stuff coming out like that. Very, very important for the plant because there's a lot of uh, nutrients in here that can dissolve into the water. So they're processing the leaf, creating little bits of fecal material there. And then another important larva you're going to find a lot of is mosquitoes and mosquitoes are everywhere even in the rainforest so let's put that over on this leaf we're going to go over on this side I kind of trying to plan it out so we get something on every leaf so let's go not on the bottom leaf but on the next one up right here and um, let's put the larvae in first I'm going to zoom in on this little puddle right there and a mosquito larvae um, don't draw it, leave a little tiny space and just make a kind of a long skinny thing like this and then it's going to be connected to the surface with a little pipe make a little pipe like that going up it's like a, it is like a little straw, it's an actual little air pipe and it hangs there, it's a little air pipe and then let's make the sides lumpy like this like that kind of a lumpy looking thing. These are like segments. 
going down like that and then kind of like a head region like that and it's got some eyes and then it's got some bristles coming off of it. Now this is a very approximate picture. If you want to really draw one, I've got a video, my video tab, you can actually draw a really nice mosquito larvae. This is just a real, real quick one. Okay, so there's the mosquito larvae which is eating. Now it's a filter feeder. So it's going to be eating some of these particles. Um, it's doing filter feeding. Now you can write that here or well, maybe I'll write it on this leaf. Larvae do filter feeding. I could fit that in there. That means it's straining out the tiny little particles. But more importantly, what's it doing? It's leaving more fecal material out the back. And that's going to float down, and that's very important to the plant. Mosquito larvae poop is really good stuff for the plant. So it's going to... Um, now, where is it going to be taking it in here? Actually, let's go down here, as long as we're over here. Let's let's put these little hairs... Let's, this will be a little out of scale, but let's remind ourselves the trichomes are all over like this. So help us understand where these things are. Little tiny hairs all along the leaf. I actually looked at some hairs, not on this exact type of bromelia, but on a different epiphyte that I have. Sure enough, little microscopic hairs like that sticking out. Okay, so even right here, so this hoop's going in and here's the little hairs. The little hairs would be going yum, yum, yum. Nutrients, nutrients. And be Now, the, it can't absorb maybe quite this something this size, but it'll dissolve in the water. You know, it'll kind of dissolve and then the trichomes can take it in. Okay, so let's make the adult mosquito. Let's just kind of go body, little circle, head, wings sticking out. Mosquito has this kind of scoopy proboscis that sticks down like that. And then you kind of go up and down, up and down, up and down, make a couple little legs like that. And let's label it Mosquito, Q-U-I-T-O, Mosquito. And right while we're down here, let's put something in this puddle. We're actually not going to put anything on this leaf. We're going to make an animal that lives its whole life cycle in the puddle. It's not like an insect that lays eggs. The, the animal actually lives, the adult lives in the water. And this is called an isopod. And so let's just make a little oval like that. And give it little antennas, little curvy, curvy antennas. Give it two tiny little eyes and then make some stripes across it for some body segments and then make some legs coming off. This thing will have like 10 or 12 legs. It's, it's kind of in the same family with crabs that have like 10 legs. So it'll have, could have 10 pairs of legs. This is called an isopod, I-S-O-P-O-D. And it would eat, um, it might eat some of these little tiny bits of leaf. There's different types of isopods, and I was not able to find research on the exact types of isopods that live in the bromeliad plant. That's a pretty particular topic. Kind of hard to find info on that one. But some of these isopods could be maybe eating the little bits of leaf. Others might eat some of the bacteria, or they might eat maybe some of the larvae, I don't know. But there's also these little isopods living here. So remember, they're not an insect, got a whole bunch of legs, they're kind of in the, the crustacean family. So now we have a lot of primary consumers. And we can even mark them out with green here. We can color code them. You would have put green in that box. And we can just put a little green dot here. This is a a, a consumer, an, a, maybe an herbivore. These are 
detrivores. We could put a little green dot next to this larvae down here. The marsh beetle gets a green dot. And over here, the mosquito. Now, female mosquitoes need blood for laying eggs, but they're, they don't actually eat it. They're actually um, herbivores. They would sip nectar or something. And then down here gets a green dot. We could even give a green dot to this guy right here. So here are our primary consumers. So these would be the equivalent of rabbits and deer and things that eat plants. So now we need to put in some predators. Every ecosystem needs predators. So things they're going to eat these guys or eat the larvae. So let's put something right here. Something that's going to look a lot like this but be a carnivore, a fearsome predator. And that's going to be a damselfly. So it's going to be a little bit like a dragonfly, but a damselfly, it's it's real similar. It's a, it's a little bit different. It has a, it's a little bit longer and skinnier. But let's start here, down here, with a small circle and then a slightly larger oval like that. Make them light because we can erase later if we need to. And then we're going to put a really long body. These, these things have really, really long abdomens. I shouldn't have said body, it's an abdomen. This is head, thorax, and abdomen. Super, super long, straight abdomen. And then it would have little segments like that. And then up here, we're going to put a wing going off like that. Actually, and make it a little bit thicker. Let's make it like that. And then we're going to overlap. That's going to be the right wing on that side of the body. And then we're going to overlap a little bit. You know how their wings you can kind of see through? So I'm going to put this wing like you can kind of see through like that. Make it a little bit longer. And then, you know, that would have that delicate little network. You can do that later if you want to add some little veining. So you can do that, that. But that's all we're going to do right now. Okay. And make it have some big eyes. Now, this is not a crane fly. This is a member of the kind of dragonfly family. So it's going to have these huge eyes. It's got amazing vision. And it's going to have, let's see, shorter legs, kind of maybe one that comes like that. And then like that. Now, remember, the legs always come off the, ab the thorax here in the middle. They never come off the abdomen. They All six legs come off that middle thorax. And then over here, you might see some little legs peeking out. And then maybe there's a leg peeking out over like that. Shave my body just a tiny tad there. All right, so that is a damselfly. Damsel, as in like damsel in distress. Oh, this one's not in distress. This one is doing very well. Flying through the skies, eating bugs. So, like a um, like a dragonfly, the adult here, it it catches things. It's flying and it, it catches bugs midair and eats them. So it's a pretty ferocious predator. And its larva is also a ferocious predator. So down in the water here, in the puddle, we're going to draw its larva. You may have seen one of these in a pond, not knowing what it is. It looks like a different animal. You'd never, ever guess that it would grow up to be a damselfly. So we're going to make a little circle like that. And then give it bulgy eyes. And then the body going to go down like this. Big, long body going down here. And then it kind of has these three things coming off the end. And then we'll kind of make some lines for segments. And then make some legs coming off up here. We can kind of color it in. They're usually fairly dark. These tiny things come off there. Like that. And then we'll give it 
be a forward looking leg like that and then let's try to fit some legs in so this is a predator I'm gonna put a red dot next to it whoops sorry about that red dot and I'll put a red dot next to our damselfly and then I'm gonna color in here to see secondary consumers so these are your predators Then we can go up here to this leaf. We can put another predator in here real quickly. Let's put in a ferocious predatorial ant. Um, let's see. It's, I'm not sure exactly how big these things are. I think they're kind of medium sized, but we'll make it a little bit larger so we can see it. So give it. We'll just make a head like that and an abdomen. Of course it's an insect so it's going to have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The abdomens usually are kind of like teardrop shaped like that. Okay, Head, thorax, and abdomen. And then this is going to be the trap jaw ant. So it can open its jaws like this. Put like a thing like that on there. It can snap them all the way open so they're straight. So these are not the antennae. It would have antennae going out like that. This is actually the uh, the jaw. And then we'll give it some legs. Remember, all the legs have to come off this middle section here. All six legs have to come off the thorax. Okay, so this is the trap jaw ant. And so it can snap those jaws shut on some kind of prey. All right, so there's another red dot predator. And then over here on this leaf, so um, we'll skip a leaf. If you have time, we're going to put a snail there. But let's skip over to here, and we can put on this leaf, it's kind of a long space. So let's put a long creature like this. Let's put a centipede here. Sometimes the centipedes at their end, this is going to be the back end. Sometimes they kind of have things like that at the back. And then they have segments like that. And don't have to count them, however many is fine. Put a head on up here. Give it some eyes. And oftentimes they have some pretty nasty looking pincer things up front there. I'm going to shade it just a bit so it looks round and we're going to give it legs. Now every segment has a pair of legs. So we're going to have a leg coming off each segment has A leg on either side. Oh, I don't like my legs, they don't look very good, but that's okay. Important point is just to know that each segment has a pair of legs. Probably on the end there's like little claw things. And you can work more if you want to spend more time on your centipede, you can. label it centipede and this is a red dot predator down here right below we can put a little crab peeking out we kind of make an make an oval kind of like this we're just gonna make him like peeking out he's kind of hiding down there and he's peeking out all right and then kind of make this a little bit lumpy and then draw a line kind of like this and then put two circles down there I looked at a picture of one I'll show you what I was looking at here's this guy peeking out it's called a grapsid crab so 
There's another one. It's kind of a complicated looking crab. So if we just kind of go something like this, like I said, just make kind of like an oval and then make two little two little lumps sticking up with eyes at the top. We'll make those are his eyes. And then he's got some kind of a, a mouth part thing. These two little circles down below are like like this. They're part of its see it has these little jaw parts somehow. So on this one, I guess he's kind of sticking out to the side. So maybe if you want to make your eye thingies going out. There's lots of different species of this thing. So whatever you draw, there's probably a crab that looks like that. So don't worry about it. Okay, something like that. And then let's just make his little claws sticking out. He's like going like this, sticking his claws over to like that. And then you can kind of make it like a... Uh, he's like... Has his claws hanging out over... Okay, and this type is called G-R-A-P, Grap, Sid, S-I-D, Crab. And again, he would get a red dot. Some of our secondary consumers. So we've saved the most famous bromeliad resident for last. And that, of course, would be the poison dart frog. This particular dart frog is often called the blue jeans frog. Looks like he's wearing blue pants there. And he kind of has a medium amount of poison. He's not the worst one. I think the most poisonous one is the golden frog. They're solid yellow. And then some are not really poisonous at all. But So this guy's kind of medium. And what makes them poisonous, the poison is in the skin, what makes them poisonous is the ants and the termites they eat. There's a chemical in the ant's body called an alkaloid, and the frog's body can process that chemical and turn it into poison and store it in the skin. So if this guy stops eating ants, he stops being poisonous. And that's why when you see people that keep them as pets, or you see them in a, a zoo, they're not poisonous because they're, they're going to feed them um, basically frog food. They're not going to let them have ants, so they're not going to be poisonous when you keep them as pets. So the dart frog relies on the bromeliad for its life cycle because it's going to put its tadpoles into these puddles. So I think as we mentioned already, there really aren't puddles in the rainforest. And of course, puddles are where you find tadpoles. So the dart frog has to climb way up into the top of the trees and find one of these plants to put his tadpoles in. But the odd thing is that it doesn't lay its eggs here. You think, well, they would just lay the egg and the egg would hatch into a tadpole because that's what most frogs do. They just simply lay their eggs in a puddle and the whole thing happens. But strangely enough, the dart frogs actually lay their eggs on the ground, on the forest floor, like under a leaf. And then it hangs around and kind of watches, and as soon as the eggs hatch, little baby tadpoles, they need to swim, they need to puddle all of a sudden, and so the frog will put the tadpole on its back, or maybe the tadpole climbs up, I don't know how that works, but the back has some kind of like sticky stuff, and it basically gives the tadpole a piggyback ride all the way up the tree, and then drops it into a puddle. And it goes down the tree, gets another tadpole, up the tree again, up and down, up and down the tree, until all the tadpoles are in little pools of water. I don't know whether they're all in the same plant, probably, but maybe not in the same puddle. They might be in different different parts of the plant. Okay, so we're going to need to draw a tadpole here. We could just go ahead and draw in here. Little tadpoles are so easy. You just kind of draw a circle with a tail on it like that. You can give it a little eye spot there. Presto, tadpole, and then we can just label it. Maybe I'll go down here, well, like this. Tadpole. And the tadpoles would start out eating very, very tiny things. Little bits of um, this stuff. And then as it got bigger and bigger, it would graduate to bigger things. So sometimes even the, um, 
the mother frog will come and put unfertilized eggs. You know, like the eggs you buy in the grocery store, you eat, they're not fertilized. Like they're never going to hatch into a baby chick. And so the same thing here. So it's just a little blob of protein. Sometimes here we'll put egg. So the mother frog will put some eggs into the water for the tadpole to eat. And then also the egg would have a little bit of poison in it, some of those alkaloid chemicals, and that would give the tadpole a head start on becoming poisonous because that's their protection system. That's what protects them from predators. So um, not only be nutrition, but it'd be a little bit of a little bit of poison for its future skin. All right, so we're going to draw the adult frog right here. And let's see. Um, start out with drawing something about, it's going to be about this big. Oftentimes it's good to start with even just an oval, just to get, you want to get approximately how big it's going to be so you don't, you kind of know where you're going when you're drawing the legs and stuff. Something like that, right? We're going to make that, we want to keep his little head on there and his legs back here, about that big. So we're, let's let's draw the back here. Make the top of your oval kind of like like a point to it. Give it a point. These guys always have a kind of a hump on their back. It's kind of odd, but they they all have this like little point on their back, like that. And then the head up here. Let's bring it around like this. And then give it like a bump on the far side like that. And then right here for this eye, make like a make like a, um sort of like a number six like that. Come around here like that, and then that part's going to get darkened to be the eye. And then we're going to come down like this. We even may want to bring this down below the eye like that. Maybe you want to stay below the eye like that. Okay. And then we want to have, make like a, a V like that. That's where the, the front leg is going to be like that. Make it real nice and skinny. And then we're going to put four toes on. The toes are, you see, very, very thin and they have a little Oops, there. And then they have a little round bump at the at the tip of each one, and that's their little suction pad. So make a little toe out, a little round bump on it like that. And then one kind of going back like that. And then its belly like this. Now for the back leg, make Make, a, make an oval, something like this. That's about where we're going. Kind of a guidance oval there. And then draw like this. Darken this part like that. And then start here in the middle and come like this around like that and under. Okay, and then this is going to be the back leg like that. And then bring it back down like this. And then just make it like you can kind of see the other leg like that behind. And then let's give it a little shadow right here. Okay, right. Make its back look like it's the right shape. It's kind of got this funny boxy look to its body. So you can kind of Indicate that like that. Kind of shade the belly under there like that. Okay, and then I'm going to let you color it. You can get some pictures of dart frogs. You can make it red and blue or black and yellow, whatever you want to. If you want to color it, you can do that. If you're going to leave it black and white, you can even just add some spots or something. But that's up to you whether you want to color it or not. I can bring the leaf out like that. Make sure everybody's sitting on it. And this would also be, get a red dot, because it eats 
It eats ants and termites and other small insects. Maybe we'll eat that mosquito if we could catch it. So then there's two things you can do if you have time. You can just stop and call it quits or you can, if you'd like to, add up here a snail. Make kind of a line like this and go around like that. Okay. Like that and then kind of curl in and then bring its body out. Give it two little eye stalks that and then this kind of snail actually kind of sticks out the back like that and then if you'd like to you can shade you know how we shaded down here well you can kind of do that if you want to maybe your pencil is dull by now it would kind of help if you had a dull pencil use the side if you kind of start right by the edge and stroke up like this and then you get lighter. Start hard and then get not too hard but then light like this. You can kind of go like that and give a little bit of uh, indication that that's behind there like that. And again also you can skip this if you'd like to. You hate to shade, you can just leave it unshaded. So you can do that to all your leaves if you'd like to. And then the very last thing I'd like to do is show you a really nice piece of artwork that I found that shows this whole ecosystem. And I'd like to give the author credit. I'm not trying to use copyrighted material inappropriately. I'm certainly not. I'll give a little ad here. This is a piece by Olivia Marie Breda Chuisano, and it is being exhibited as part of the uh, uh, an exhibit called Selby's Secret Garden at Payne Mansion at the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens in Sarasota, Florida. So if you want to see the original, you got to go to Florida, to Sarasota, go to the Marie Selby Botanical Gardens, find Payne Mansion, and see if the exhibit is still up called Selby's Secret Garden. And so here the artist has um, made a more fanciful design. I mean, we had our little critters who were trying to sort of simulate nature. So here's because it's a piece of art. She put all these little creatures in a, in a circle here to make it artistic. But we can recognize a lot of these. Here's the marsh beetle. Now here's a jumping spider. Maybe you might want to add a spider to yours uh, somewhere. There's the mosquito larvae. And there's a um, an extra, I think it's a caddis fly. There's the trap jaw ant. Here's a centipede. This is called a pseudoscorpion. It's actually not a scorpion. It has eight legs. It's an arachnid, but it's, it's its own thing called a pseudoscorpion. And this is a tiny little worm. Here we have the isopod, another beetle, a snail. This is some of the little bacteria, actually. This is an enlarged view of bacteria in the water. Background of the marsh beetle, we've got the damselfly, and there's our little crab, and our frog. So I just thought that was a really nice uh, piece to end with. And if you'd like to add some color to your drawing, you may, or extra creatures, you can add whatever you'd like to.